To celebrate publishing over 100 episodes of the Fishing the DMV podcast and surpassing 2,000 subscribers on YouTube, I am giving away a free guided fishing trip with Billy Coles of Smith Mountain Lake Fishing Guide Services. The giveaway will run through Wednesday, April 5th through Saturday, May 6th, and I'm going to give you three unique opportunities to win the fishing trip. Number one, the number one way that you can enter the competition is by leaving a review of the show at Apple Podcasts. After the review at the very bottom, comment hashtag fishing the DMV and you're automatically entered in the sweepstakes. Number two, commenting on every video that I drop from Wednesday, April 5th through Saturday, May 6th. And then at the end of your comment, leave hashtag fishing the DMV. And then you're again entered to win the competition. Number three, the final way that you can enter a chance to win is by ordering online from Jake's Bait and Tackle. Every online order through them automatically enters you with a chance to win as long as you leave the hashtag fishing the DMV. The contest again runs through Wednesday, April 5th through Saturday, May 6th. Good luck. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. Uh, Today, we have Brian Peeler uh, on the show. And and this was, again, this is what I really like about doing this now is that I've had a couple people in the comments section before say like, well, what do I have to do to get on the show? Do I have to win a tournament? Do I have to be a Bassmaster Classic qualifier? Blah, blah, blah. Like, no, you just got to be able to have knowledge. You are in the area and you want to share some of that knowledge. And some of these people I really love to have on the show are local guides. And and Brian kind of fits that category. He runs out of the Front Royal uh, area of Virginia on the Shenandoah River. Brian, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, Thomas, thanks for having me. Um, been watching, listening, and finally took the opportunity to reach out on social media, like you've said in your, your previous podcasts and, and even posted about a little bit, if you had any interest to, to be on the show or thought you could share something everybody else could benefit from when, when getting out and fishing in the area to drop you a line. And, and here I am. It's funny because like when you take a river or a lake or something like that, it's kind of like a painting where if you have 50 people look at it, you're going to get 50 different like ideas of how what it means or how to approach it. And that's the same thing with fishing. You know, I think it's impressive. I think it's fun from my standpoint when you have multiple people on, you talk about the same body of water. And no one's opinions are always 100 percent the same. Everyone has their own little take on it. And I just think that's super fascinating. Yeah. So the. The Shenandoah specifically, I don't think anybody's going to go out there without a, a Ned rig or yeah. like a finesse jig, but you know, everybody has their thing they like to fish and, and for some guys that's using fly gear, other guys it's conventional tackle and some people only fish whopper ploppers or somebody only wants to fish a black and blue Senko. And that's, if that's what they want to get out there and do and it works for them, cool. I'm not going to tell anybody not to fish top water if they're biting it because it's, it's, it's the most fun. <laughs> it, it really is. Uh, what, and this was, I know this would be a little bit of a rehash for you, but like what got you into this? Cause your story is fascinating. Uh, well, something we didn't, didn't touch on before going live. Um, I, I found myself on workers comp last winter after getting hurt on a, on a job site, I caught a trim router to my hand and uh, I got, I got so lucky. It didn't, oh my it, God. It, it was, it was cosmetic. I didn't hit anything that wasn't going to heal. So no bone damage, no tendon ligament, anything. It was just really, really painful for a really long time. And I was sitting at home and thought about, man, like, I could have not been able to go back to my job, swing a hammer, you know, Monday through Friday. I would have had to learn how to fish completely different without having a thumb. If I lost my thumb, uh, it's my, my reeling hand. It's my stripping hand on a fly rod. Um, yeah, there's just a lot of things and got me really thinking about fishing and how, when I'm out on different areas of the river, I don't see a whole lot of people, at least not that are coming up river first and then come and floating back down. You know, it's, it's the tubers in the summer or kayakers, 
uh, who are dropping in somewhere and, and doing a nice long float and really have to keep moving during the day to get back to a vehicle in a reasonable time so that they, they don't get stuck on an unreasonable float with their significant other. <laughs> that's, me. that's me guys <laughs> uh, well, I've, I've been there solo where i've just i've bit off more than i can chew and just got completely roasted just it, middle of the summer ran out of water ran out of snacks and still had miles <laughs> it, it, it can happen so easily especially on the shannon i think the shenandoah especially because it's so close to dc where you're going to have all those people coming out and i remember travis Eden saying like some a, a couple were going to do the exact same float on paddle boards in the evening and it's like you guys are starting at 6 p.m you're not going to make it but they've never been to the river before yeah. you know they just said like it's pretty we just went to a vineyard or two what's going out on the river yeah it for that kind of thing, reaching out to a guide service, you know, whether it's me, Travis, Front Royal Outdoors, or one of the other outfitters that do the tube and kayak rentals and, and shuttle services, you it's in your best interest if you don't know or don't know somebody that knows, mm -hmm. make a phone call, shoot an email, and get an idea. Because if you don't know what the flow levels mean, and how that's going to affect your trip a, a four mile float down the river can be four miles of you dragging a kayak or a tube and not really enjoying yourself because it's work to get down river especially if there's a little bit of a breeze you know when the, the flow is not high the wind will push you back up river in a heartbeat it's not worth dying over you know you, you got to be sworn oh, out there absolutely out. yeah there's there's a lot of things that can go wrong with with any water sport or activity surrounding water and uh whether it's it's drowning or dehydration or an injury due to to negligence of some sort there's yeah any number of things that could go wrong in even a short period of time out on the water so have you always grown up on the shenandoah are you are you from this area originally yeah so uh we moved up to Virginia from Kentucky when I was four. I grew up in Fairfax County in Springfield. Um, pretty good access to places to fish around there. Uh, Pohick Bay, Occoquan Reservoir, did a lot of fishing on the reservoir. Well, in the reservoir, not on the reservoir. We didn't take a boat out a whole lot. Um, lots of fishing from the bank, night fishing for catfish. Um, I told you before the the muskie that my dad had caught uh, across from the Lake Ridge Marina before that whole side of the reservoir was developed. Um, pretty crazy is the only one, only one I've heard of coming out of there. Uh, I caught on a rattle trap fishing for bass. A muskie in Aquacon Reservoir. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, and and I even recall recently talking to him about it, and he's. He's caught pike. He fished in Alaska, Canada, grew up out in Oklahoma. He's 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 well versed in the angling world. And I was like, "You sure it wasn't a pike?" Because I'd found out there had been pike stockings in the past, and it was a an absolute hard no. It was not a pike. Um, so it, I I've never found anything that DWR or DGIF at at that point had done anything in the reservoir it could have been planted by somebody i mean it's obviously not an uncommon theme in the area with people finding something that they they want or like to fish for and and putting it in a body of water closer to home um but i guess the the good thing about muskie or, or pike is they're not quite as inclined to reproduce like the snakehead do and i've got nothing against the snakehead I, oh, that's, that's a whole fun can of I, I, I just just to put it out there i i think dwr is doing a really good job um the fish have been around for decades now and i don't personally think they're doing too much damage i'd like to get into fishing for them more um especially now that i've i've got a boat and i can get around into some of the skinnier areas um that a, a larger boat may not be able to, and certainly areas that I don't feel like paddling to on a kayak. Uh, but that's not really that's not really my 
my niche or my thing. Um, we nothing, nothing's more diehard than it is. So, I mean, like, again, so when we were recording this episode, guys, I just had a snakehead episode drop today. And I know <laughs> in the comment sections on Instagram, there, there are people like bad mouthing bow fishermen saying they'll shoot your dog, you know, your cat, they'll shoot anything that's moving. And it's just the tribalism is, it is almost like football teams. It's insane. How bow, bow fishing's tough. Uh, yeah. and if I, I think with any, any sport, shooting sport you you have to spend the time and be able to acquire your target you know you're there's specific species you can shoot and there are speci there are specific species that you cannot shoot mm -hmm. it's just like when seasons are closed for hunting or even for for fishing for different species in different areas of the country um you follow the rules make the judgment call hopefully using your best judgment at the time and and if you goof you got to own up to it you know I, yeah but, but there's there's always somebody in any sport that yes they might they might be willing to shoot your dog if it gets in front of them you know to, that that type, type of scenario you know yeah. they just they just want to throw an arrow they and just the hardest just thing is the dog dog the doc talk is so hard to like come through and cut through because you know you hear rumors when, when you're out there and and hopefully guys i will be trying to get a bow fishing company on to kind of talk about it because at this point i've literally heard everything uh like and i want to cut out, down on some of these rumors and actually find some common ground with that but but the whole point of me like like starting that back up was just like how passionate all the different sectors of anglers are and i think snakehead anglers are, are slowly skyrocketing the t to the top up with trout fishermen and musky guys is just extremely passionate diehards um <laughs> in a short period of time too considering yes 20 20 years isn't a whole lot of time it's I mean, not yeah it especially for the population to build the quality of fish that people are pulling when you think about how long it takes for a largemouth bass to hit double digits or a musky to be over 40 inches which for the state is a citation you go out west and you can keep your your 40 inch you're looking for the 50s which 50 inch fish are hanging around you just got to find them how big was that musket that kid caught you were talking about earlier actually just actually set the stage tell that story again because that thing was fascinating um uh, which one the uh, one, the reservoir the one on the river the one that the uh, kid. Oh, 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 the one in in Canada when yeah. I was a camp counselor. So we're gonna we'll take a jump back two thousand eight. I was getting ready to go into my last year of college at VMI, and I worked as a camp counselor in Minnesota. And uh, it was a boys camp, and they had the cabins set up in different age groups. And the age group that I worked with most of the summer had a trip up to the Canadian side of Rainy Lake to a property the camp owned and that's a cool place i would love to go there you're lucky i yeah i had one so it's a good smallmouth fishery i had one smallmouth come up to the boat and then spook one i i couldn't keep pike off the end of my line oh my god we had we had two walleye that came up and still lost them at the boat everything mm. was pike and it was everybody was catching fish it was great but we had a three-day stretch and i think it was the last group that came up that year we were out fishing the first day i landed a 47 inch pike which that's still my biggest toothy fish in freshwater to this day it's a that's massive insane. fish um and two days later had two kids out on the boat one of them hadn't caught a fish the whole summer and i was trying to to play the ratio right so that it wasn't just a one-on-one -on -one, somebody getting special attention for the summer or for a day at a camp and we were pulling through uh the channel not too far from the cabin and the boat and one of the boys hooks up and big fish it gets up to the surface it is a musky much larger than the pike that i had landed a few days before i told you it was probably mid 50s class fish easy it thrashed once and swam away with the spoon hooked in its mouth it had pulled the snap straight on the leader wow retied 
I think it was the next cast from the same kid pulls up a probably eight or nine pound walleye that was 28 inches, just football shape. It was, it was silly. And at that point we were out of time. I had to go back to the cabin and, and wait for pickup. But that was, that was my first real memory with a muskie. And it was after weeks of just catching pike. Like, I was tired of catching pike. I was specifically throwing things that we hadn't been catching pike on to catch walleye, smallmouth, whatever wanted to bite, and still caught pike. Now, did you did you catch a lot of pike in Alaska too when you were stationed in Alaska? I I went out a handful of times. I didn't catch any pike in Alaska other than ice fishing. Hmm. So I anytime I went out and I was casting, didn't have any luck. Through the ice jigging was a tip, completely different story. Just drop a tube down there or a, a hair jig that I tied. And, you know, it, you usually couldn't keep them off. There there weren't many bad days pike fishing and, you know, flying a skunk flag home. But some days you'd only catch one or two. And depending on body of water, they weren't particularly large. But I caught a, a lot of... Uh, a lot of trout and char, and they look so cool. Those char, I've seen pictures of them, man. They, they look yeah, so the, the char and Darley, Dolly Varden when they color up are super, super pretty fish. They get that teal and that that bright orange. Um, some lake trout and a bunch of grayling. Grayling fishing up there in most areas is comparable to to pan fish down here. You. You throw, you throw something out, whether it's a fly or bait. If it looks like food, they're probably going to eat it. Dude, did you do? Was that mostly fly fly fishing you did up there, or spin tackle? I I fished mostly fly gear up there, um, okay. which I told you before. But for anybody listening, that's where I was introduced to to properly using a fly rod. Um, before we had a five weight spooled up with mono as a kid then we'd vertical jig around lay downs for crappie um, below the Lake Jackson dam and on the, the reservoir. But I got up to Alaska. I got plugged into project healing waters, learned to tie my own flies, build rods, learned to fly fish. And it, it increased my catch rate. Um, in in a lot of situations up there where the the more airy flowy or natural presentation of a fly seemed to be way more enticing for for the whatever fish we were we were targeting i didn't go anywhere without spinning gear or casting gear and when it was time to throw bait for kings i was out there soaking bait on my my bait caster and i'm I'm not particularly loyal to any one discipline in the angling world. I'm, but it's nice to have that under your belt because it got you more familiar because, you know, as we, in this story, guys slowly switch back to the Shenandoah as a guy that is nice to like have that experience under your belt now. Understanding how this stuff works for sure. Um, even the different presentations or make the decision that, I'm going out by myself. I'm only going to throw top water today because I want to see what they won't hit or figuring out the right combination of fly line with leader and flies to be able to fish deeper effectively during the winter. Um, or even just when the water's cold, because even, you know, getting super finessey with conventional gear, it's tough fishing in the winter a lot of times. And, if you're using a floating line and you don't have like a 10 foot leader on your fly rod and you don't have a weighted fly or you're not adding split shot or whatever combination of, of things you need, it's going to make it really tough, but an intermediate line or a sinking line or sinking tip line and understanding what all those things mean at different points of flow or different areas of the river can be really beneficial. Not just for myself when I'm out fishing, um, whether I'm scouting or I've got a free day and I get some time on the water, but helping people find fish on the end of their line. 
And then so you go from Alaska, you come back. How, how long were you in Alaska for? And I, you know, I didn't even ask. Which, which branch did you serve with? Uh, I was in the army. I, in the I, army. I commissioned out of EMI in 2009, went active duty 2010, was at infantry school in Georgia and then Alaska and broke my back up there and, and was med boarded out. I mean, you almost lose your hand, dude. Come on, stay away from sharp objects, please. Good God. I, I, I live life hard, I guess. <laughs> it, the, the, the easy path isn't my path. Um, but uh, I was in Alaska six and a half years, something like that. Was able to learn a lot, you know, just having the ability to soak in the fishing culture up there and get plugged in with these old heads who had fished drift boats in the PNW on some of those gnarly salmon rivers and moved up to Alaska and how to fish the Kenai, which is a huge trophy fishery for salmon and rainbows and seeing some really big fish get pulled out of there. Um, fish in the salt water. I, I have no desire to run a big boat, but I'll go out and fish on one and and just talking to the deckhands or going out on guide trip and picking their brain you know why are they doing this or you know do you think this could be applied somewhere else um i think how i would rig up a line for catfishing now having fished up in alaska using bait might be a little bit different if i was fishing flowing water how so suspend the bait and the hook get it up yeah. Get it up off the bottom. Is that a trout or salmon? Like, where did you pick that up? At? Uh, fishing for for kings, oh. and, and I guess silvers too. But a lot of people just fish under a bobber for silvers up there. But for kings, you run a a slide on your your running line, and then you've got a cork of some sort on your leader that'll suspend the bait up above the weight that sits on the bottom. And then all the cures that people use on the eggs will milk and it creates a scent trail down the water. Oh. So not that the fish are particularly feeding at this point any longer, but they'll catch onto that scent, follow it up, and then they'll get territorial. Hmm. Um, so that, that's why I like just not just fishing bass. It's so weird. Like ever since I started this, this podcast, I had an idea of like what I wanted to do in the fishing world. And then afterwards it's like, you know what? I really want to catch a snakehead. I actually want to learn how to fly fish. I want to catch a muskie on a fly. It's like, there's so much more than just one type of species to go chase now. Yeah. So musky on conventional gear is hard enough. Like you might be able to find them. You might move them, but your access being able to cast, you know, a hundred feet with a five or six ounce lure on a casting rod versus struggling to make a decent 70 foot cast with a fly rod and no weight really other than your line trying to move a big air resistant or wind resistant fly mm -hmm. um, it even even bass fishing with fly gear it it adds a level of difficulty and you have to learn to be patient <laughs> <laughs> because if you you rush stuff you know it's not you can't power fish a fly rod not effectively um you might be able to sling casts back to back but your catch rate will go down you're going to spook more fish slap in the water with your fly line um take the time a couple good false casts lay a line out there and then then bring it back in appropriately for whatever fly you're fishing um you know, it's, you're not ripping a crankbait or, or anything back to the boat or a spinnerbait um, of any form, really, underspin, conventional spinnerbait. What's Oops. it like setting the hook into a muskie on a spinning rod or a fly rod? Because I'm just thinking of when I think fly rods, I have <laughs> a, a probably a poor assessment of what they are, a little bit more flimsy. When you're stripping, I mean, it, does it is it feel like it's harder to get a good hook set into them? Because it must be like slamming into concrete. It's it's got to be deliberate. Don't trout set. Uh, is in don't try and set like you would with a spinning or a casting rod. You're just not going to get the penetration, even with the razor sharp hooks that 
that a lot of us use on the the big flies their faces are just so hard and bony um you you really need to get a good strip set so ideally you're looking at your fly and visibility is good enough that you can kind of at least make out the shape moving through the water column and you're waiting for it to disappear or you're waiting for that big flash of green and gold or even if the line gets tight if you can't see it strip set the flies can get kind of pricey if you hang up and lose them every once in a while but a, a makeshift lure retrieval tool will go a long way if you get hung up on a on a lay down or submerged log or something you'll be a lot happier about me being unhappy for losing a fly on the water that day then you will be about missing a muskie and i've made that mistake a number of times where i should have strip set but i was like no i know this area like there's a lay down here and then i see the flash of gold and it's gone mm, dude. Well, uh, and, and i think it's chris willen he he guides down in tennessee and then um during the summer he's up in wisconsin i i think it was a video with him i watched and before the guys he got on the water with his guys for the trip that day he did um or, there's a couple of videos seen but showed the effective power behind a trout set just lifting the rod to set the hook and he's holding on to the the guide's holding onto the fly the fly never leaves his hand wow. you put the tip of the rod at the fly and you pull the line and you the guide can't hold onto the hook um uh, so there's there's a that's interesting you, it's it's kind of like throwing a heavy jig or a, a punching setup on a cranking rod when you go to there's so much rod that has to load up before you even get the right amount of tension it's just not going to be effective you know you want to a nice stiff rod when you're you're fishing heavy nasty stuff so or even frogging you know it's the same deal so um, is musky fishing um w when you start or i guess that let's i guess that's the question i need to ask first uh you just got your boat you got your boat dialed in you're, you're starting to guide now are you primarily going to be looking at musky anglers as your target audience or who will be your target audience I'm open to take anybody out on the water. If you want to learn to fly fish, you can book a lesson and we'll go to an area that will hopefully catch fish. I feel like the motivation there is a whole lot better and the learning curve is shorter when you're not casting a piece of yarn on the end of the rod in a field. It, you know, the, the technique is applicable but people who need to, to see how things are actually going to work on the water, we get to do that. And there's areas on the river where we have the room to do that. And it's not traffic to the point where you have to worry about hooking somebody on a tube or a kayak passing by you. Um, so if, beginner anglers, uh, if you want to come out on a bass trip, we can float. We got fly rods, got spinning gear. Um, if you want to bring casting gear, that you're comfortable with that's cool bring it out it just it as a guide it it creates more problems on the water and more things that i have to manage mm -hmm. if we're constantly getting backlashed on my gear so the the spinning rods help alleviate some of that and like to keep it simple you know there's not many things i'd fish on the river that you couldn't effectively fish on spinning gear anyway uh, Thanks. Thanks. and until you get to the muskie uh, but with the shenandoah typically turning into bath water uh towards the end of july and staying pretty warm until september sometime uh, i'll take the muskie bookings off the website just because the the warm water beats them up if you catch them on bass gear you got to do your best to to revive them get them back on the get them back in the water or back on their own. Um, but I know they're doing studies down on the James with warm water mortality. Everybody has their own opinion on specific temperature range. And 
I feel like the people that want to come out and fish for them or try to fish for them, or even myself, somebody who enjoys just making themselves miserable out on the water for days at a time, searching for maybe a fish to follow so you can get eyes on one. Uh, you, I'm, I'm not interested in, in hurting my business partners. Mm-hmm. And, so, and that's it. So I, I had a uh, Robin Glenn on who is one of the guides down on the James river th- a couple weeks ago. I think that launched. And that was the thing I brought up is like musk anglers are just so good at understanding the preservation. And I, I kind of get upset at my bass guys too. Cause you know, like we had the whole call tag thing about puncturing the lips and stuff. And, and, and some guys can be bad about how they handle them, but musky guys, generally speaking, seem to be pretty lockstep on preservation. Well, I, I mentioned before, you know, we're, we're trying to protect, I guess, part of our livelihood by taking care of a resource that the state is nice enough to provide for us in our waterways, um, or at least help manage in our waterways. Um, I think a lot of the trout guys, especially the guys that fish for natives, you know, they get in the mountains and they're catching their little six inch brookies on the regular those are important fish to, to take care of, you know, they're, they're easier or they're more easily affected by, by big swings in environment. And yeah, if the muskie can, and even pike can hang out in warm water, but they're not a a warm water species by any means. They, they're going to stay active all through the winter because it's more comfortable for them to do so. Mm. You know, they might only eat once or twice a week um, at that point when they're not moving a whole lot in the winter. But if you can get them to eat, it's usually a pretty big eat. Is it safe to say that musky are your passion? No, I, at least not for the business. I, me personally, it's kind of like the new thing. I, I really have found a lot of joy in going out and being miserable for <laughs> that's such an interesting way to hours put it. <laughs> and hours and if you're you're fly fishing for them you it it's tough that's really rough on you that's a lot of casting you're not using light um fly gear so it's it's a lot of movement and you can't catch them if you're you don't have a fly in the water so where you have the ability to pick up 30 plus inches per crank on a casting reel and you've got a nice big rod and you can throw three to five ounce lure all day without getting beat up you spend four to five hours on the river with a fly rod and you're not used to that sort of casting you're going to be sore the next day and probably the day after that and you may cramp while we're out on the water it it's just it's a little bit different and i think the challenge is what is what's driving me to to figure out more, at least personally. But providing the access for people to to experience that too. Um, right, on, right on. So yeah, I mean, I would love to kind of get into. Um, I can pull this up here on my screen here. Get a little map study and just kind of let, so everyone knows and understands the area that you work out of. Um, so right now I have up on the screen here, we got Google Earth and Navionics. So we got the Shenandoah and you said primarily um, that you're working out of the South Fork, correct? Uh, no, um, I'd say primarily I've got a little bit of overlap with Travis at Kingfisher Guide Service from like Morgan's Ford Bridge down to Farms Riverview. Um, still being newer with the boat, I haven't taken the time to invest further down like towards route 50 or anything like that. Um, or even going as far as seven, it can be pretty fishy water from what I understand, but, um, shuttling and figuring out stuff with the kayak in previous years was, was pretty difficult some weekends. So, uh, from Warren dam down, if the flow is right, I can get all the way up to the dam. I was just up there Saturday in the boat. Um, running my towy scout with a little two-stroke jet on the back. Um, and I was, I mean, the, the 
power plant house right there. I had the the boat all the way up there, and it's pretty skinny, and you can walk up. Uh, I could have touched the water coming down the dam on Saturday. Where do you I mean, launch to get to this? I I launched at Morgan Ford Bridge. Hmm. Um, it's not ideal in the fact that you can't get a regular boat in there easily. Um, but with the improvement there at the parking area, somebody's been down there with equipment and moved some of the bigger rocks. Um, so you've got a couple options for for lanes to back a trailer in, depending on the water level. Where the and hell is Morgan Ford Bridge? It's uh, it's it's down. We're, yeah, so you're like right on top of it, right there. Right here. Okay. Oh God, it's still under construction. Dang. Oh, wow. That's a way old picture there. How old is this picture, you think? Uh, so I've been out here seven years. Oh, this is 2017. Or, yeah. yeah, I was, I was going to say that was that was before I, or just after I moved out to the area. Dude, I didn't realize the map was that old. That's crazy. Yeah, so it, it's a little bit different. They've got a nice, a nice bridge, which it's still a low water bridge. It'll, it'll get underwater. When we've got high water events, I've seen full size trees sticking perpendicular and full size trees that have been washed down um, from further up river. Um, but I'll, I'll launch on the downstream side. So the east side of the, the bridge um, and then I'll, I'll motor up or I'll start drifting down and I I can do the the little waterfall hydraulic rapid um, on the way to Farms or review in the boat, but if I don't have to, the fishing from the next shelf down to the the takeout at the boat launch there isn't great. It it can be good when the water's warm because there's a lot of shade on the bank. All this section right in here. Yeah, it's. It, yeah, it can, it can get a little tough. Um, it's such a, it's such a big amount of, and that's what's so crazy when you talk about for river anglers and why you need a guide or a boat or something. Unlike a lake, there's so much dead river. There's so much dead water in these stretches that if you're not on the right thing, you could take your kid down there, but you're just not going to get have much success at all. Well, even even when you can find the fish, you know, I'm I'm not the first guy that that's been on the, the show with you that'll tell you that you can find them. That doesn't mean they're going to bite. Sometimes mm -hmm. they just, they'll be locked out. They'll be shut down. It's, it's too cold or the flow's not right, or it's too hot and they just want to cool off in the shade that they can find or find the, the water with the higher oxygen levels. Cause it's getting roughed up by rapids or something. And yeah, knowing, or at least identifying when the fish are acting like that and being able to, to move on. Okay. We can try this spot over here. There's a good hole. It's going to be cooler, you know, or this bank, the bait's going to be over here because of this, this, and this, you know, things to, to key in on, um, is pretty important, but I, I fish that stretch a lot just cause it's super close to the house. I fished over by Easton park a lot going from there to the confluence and then taken out at uh, the Riverton launch. The biggest muskie I've seen was above the dam. It followed a big bucktail in on me one time. Above Riverton or above? It was above the dam. So between, it was near, kind of near the golf course, okay. um, just to give people an idea. And that, that stretch can be really good because you've got good deep water and it'll hold everything. There's, big bait for the muskie to chew on there's plenty of panfish and, and other bait for the the bass to chew on there's good cat fishing there there's decent bank access if you want to pay the fee to fish from the golf course you know you get a pretty good bend in the river to fish there um but dropping at the confluence if the water's good you can go up the north fork or most of the time it's not so you can head up the south fork towards Easton park there's some some good fishing up that way, um, and then at Goonie Creek area, dropping at Caro, the boat, my boat's pretty light, 
so I can manhandle it on and off the trailer if I need to launch it in ankle deep water. So getting out when the flow's not great or levels are super low because we haven't had rain in a month and it's the middle of the summer, um, we can we can still get into areas that maybe other people aren't launching a boat in anymore, or they're not drifting from uh, upriver because they just can't get past certain areas or rapids or shoals or, or whatever's going on. So, um, and I mentioned Egypt Bend as well. Uh, that's still a newer area to me just because it's about an hour from the house. Mm. But good water down there, pretty fishy as far as musky and bass go. Uh, and you get a little further down that way, and you can find some more largemouth on the river as well. You can find them on the main stem, but you just you don't catch them nearly as often as the smallmouth. What what is the river like right now? I mean, we're here. It's about early April. We're getting into April here. Hopefully, we have some stable weather. Spring is coming. They should be chewing. Yeah. So the river this weekend was, I think it was a little warmer on Saturday, but the weather, despite the wind, was a little bit warmer leading up to that. And then we kind of crashed overnight, and it got no warmer than 40 on sunday on the river water's high 40s i saw 49 something and then 48 something was the warm temp on sunday um fish are moving we're we got a pretty good stain on the river right now a super fishy stain um it's not gin clear so you're not spooking fish and it's not stained so bad from the little bit of rain or whatever that you can't see it's not chocolate milk and if you're interested in in target and musky this is i mean it's prime conditions maybe not the wind we had over the weekend it was pretty miserable out there but uh, as far as the water clarity goes it it works out in your benefit um to have a little bit of that stain because the the fish don't get big from being dumb facts <laughs> how what is the how to word this everyone knows about the james it's almost like nationally ranked when it comes to the muskie is the shenandoah muskie scene is it big or is it like no one's talking about it because no one's doing it yet i i feel like it was one of those it's one of those deals where until you start doing it you don't really notice kind of kind of like getting a new vehicle you know you get you know what maybe isn't the hot color or it's a limited color and then you start seeing that color everywhere you drive mm. uh, or you know the guys running the the soft camper shells on their their trucks i never saw anybody with them anywhere uh other than one buddy in alaska until i put one on my colorado years ago and then i saw them everywhere and there was there was another guy here in town that had the same color Colorado. I think his was a gas instead of the diesel, but he had the topper on it. And I was like, hey, I'm driving the other way down, <laughs> down 55. Um, but I've I've upgraded my truck since then. Don't have a camper on it. Uh, but now, I mean, I I saw white Chevys everywhere. You know, it's a pretty standard work truck. So I was I was not expecting to to be the only one out there. Uh, but on the on the river, once I started fishing for muskie, you start cluing in on on what things look like when they hit the water. So from fifty yards, hundred yards away, you see somebody hucking a big, you know, swim bait looking thing. It's probably not a swim bait and a guy fishing for bass. Mm -hmm. um, or even look for a giant net. You, know, you see a giant net hanging off somebody's boat or their kayak. It's probably not for bass. Maybe for carp. Maybe um, something that I like to get into because there's plenty of them out there. But, oh my god, that would but, be that would be fun. But the, and I I'm kicking myself. I didn't get into it during the Brudex hatch. Everyone, I I <laughs> killing myself too because like Travis was showing me photos of them like smacking crankbaits and just everything. It's I, I caught one on a chrome popper. Really. On a, on an ultralight and it worked me <laughs> <laughs> how big was it how many was it 15 pounds it it might have been 12 pounds 
But I mean, on the ultralight. Oh yeah. It, yeah, it just I was I had a few minutes one morning before having to drive into Fairfax County for work because we had an early inspection and and needed to pick some stuff up on a job site and it it came out of the shallows and I initially I thought I had a a muskie coming out just from how it staged and watching the the V track towards my my popper and hammered it and then tried to run down river on me and I got it turned right at the last minute before I would have had to break it off. <laughs> that is but, a resource that I think if people could consistently catch them on artificials, not more like the catfish way where you're just chucking bait and sitting, but like on a fly right. and stuff, because they are, I think I, I saw an LA clip once, uh, some guys fishing in these sewer rivers and, and they called them like trash bone fish because that's basically what they are on a fly. They're, they're shaped similar for sure. You know, you get a little more depth from, from belly to back on the fish. Uh, but there's a few different varieties and there's massive, just huge carp. And if you spend any amount of time on the river, even this time of year, they'll, they'll find the right thing that they want to eat off the top and go airborne. And you're fishing, looking one direction. All you hear is giant splash behind you. And if you like to fish, your immediate reaction is, yeah. you know, behind you, seeing what's going on. And it, it's wild. Um, and fighting them on a fly rod, it, yeah, you, you're probably looking at at losing more fish as you learn how to figure them out, just because you've got different drag sensitivities and if they're spooling you and you cup the reel wrong and you catch the knob on the handle and it tries to take your thumbnail off you're really not going to be happy um but yeah it's not quite as simple as as hooking up and sometimes flies don't like to stay pinned as well as conventional lures do are they but, shy or are, are carp shy for that kind of stuff or are they pretty eager to eat I, I think they're super temperamental. Um, usually, if you can see them, they know you're there, and they're less likely to to react to anything you throw at them. Um, but if you can spot the the mud streaks and they're down there rooting for for bugs and and crayfish and whatever and you have the right presentation, I think it's going to get mixed up with the activities going on. You got a really good chance there. Okay. But, I mean, if you, you spent time on the river, as soon as you get on top of them, they're gone. And then you might see one or two, and then you see the rest of the school and they're bolting to the other bank. Uh, same thing with the suckers, you know, they're, they're super spooky. So you, I, I think the difficulty level there is stepping it up a few. They're probably, probably somewhere between bass and musky as far as difficulty level go. Because that is no. a resource that you guys have on the river that no one seems to be really trying to tap right now. They, the reputation's bad, you know. Yeah, I'm. I understand as an an angler that you want to see big fish. You know, it's fun to go out and catch big fish, get a new PB, you know, have that trophy send in for a citation with the state. Um, and I, I don't know that I'd be interested in eating carp, but I, I grew up eating bass. People say it tastes like mud. I, no, it doesn't. You know, it just, that's not what you like to eat. Fine. Or you don't understand that you have to pick some of those in between fish out of the the pool for the big ones to get bigger. Um, and it, it's tough, you know, they're, they're looked at as a trash fish, you know, they're a bottom feeder, which I don't know how that makes them too much different from catfish other than catfish have a much larger mouth and will potentially eat other fish when the opportunity is presented. But it, they're, a lot of their forage is the same. They're breathing a lot of the same water in the river, sitting on the bottom. 
No, no th- those are facts. Those that that is facts, one hundred percent. So then, you know, right now, I guess we're going to be in musky season, going to smallmouth season. Uh, musky, right now, you said this was really good water for them. What are you looking for right now when you get out there? Uh, so if I'm if I'm out scouting, I think I'd rather have clear water, um, because if you can. If you know where you might find them, you can usually get them to move. So in the scouting aspect, it's good to find the fish. And it's easier to do that when you can see, you know, sight fishing, you know, beds. It it can be a lot of fun and just plain silly because it doesn't matter. You're going to get that reaction strike. Mm. Um, or even trout fishing, you see your fish coming up and, and sipping bugs off the, the surface, you've got eyes on and you position yourself to make the cast to try and get in, get the drift right in front of them and give them a presentation that you hope they eat. It's easier to do that when you can see them. Um, but going out to fish for them, having, you know, a light stain, you know, maybe four foot of is, like good visibility on the river, I would say is ideal, especially if you're fishing something not on the bottom, because you can probably see it in most of the areas you're fishing. Um, especially if you think they're holding to structure, there's not a whole lot of structure in the middle of the river until you get to some of the deeper sections and you get the nice ledges and, and all the crevasses and everything that come with that. But you know, if you're fishing log jams or big laydowns and stuff like that, you're maybe five feet of water, eight if it's if it's a deeper deeper hole around there. So you you get about half the depth of the water to see what your fly is doing or what your lure is doing. You know, part of it's figuring out what your lure or fly is doing. How do you need to adjust your retrieve to get the fly to kick side to side and give that you know, broadside presentation or, you know, is your bucktail hanging up or do you need to make a, a tighter movement with your glide bait or whatever the case is. Um, it, it, it's easier when you can see what your bait or lure is doing or your fly, but you can't see the fish until they're on it. Maybe you start to see a shadow as they follow, but if, if you can't see them when you make the cast, they likely can't see you and that's uh, going to make them a little more eager to move they're not particularly boat shy um especially if they're they're on the hunt but there's obviously things that you can do wrong and they'll put the brakes on quick and then disappear <laughs> just like any other fish in the river they they camouflage pretty well how fast do they restage or when you burn them you burn them for the day <laughs> They usually don't go far, um, even if you've pinned one and it comes off or, or you release one, they're going to stay in the general area that they're, you know, they've got home. Um, I think guys down on the James and I, I think, uh, DWR guys have talked about it a little bit where they've had fish move, you know, seven plus miles on the, the James. Um, just out of the blue, you know, hmm. not like a gradual migratory thing. It's like one year the fish is here, the next year it's over here, and then it holds out in that area for years before it moves or makes a big move again. Um, I I think the Shenandoah is similar in that aspect where if you find the fish, you can usually find them again. Um, you may not throw anything they want that day. And that, that's what's really tough about musky fishing. You, you can go out with high hopes, but your expectations need to be real. They're, they're not a fish you catch every time you go out. It's, it's not like saving yourself from a skunk on a bad day of bass fishing and throw a bobber out with a worm and, and get a bluegill well, type deal. Well, now that we're in April, like, what do you think your odds are if you took some out just to see one? Uh, depending on clarity... Um, 50, 50, I'd say 50, 50 is pretty fair. Um, 
you know, if I have two days back to back with people fishing for muskie, they might see some of the same fish depending on where we can get access to with my boat and, and what the fish are doing. But I've, I've drifted over a hole in my kayak before and got excited because I thought I'd see one there. And then I saw a second muskie and then drifted over a third one and they're all within 10 feet just hanging out. Wow. Super cold water. Uh, it was last winter, the winter before, but they were all 40 ish. It's a pretty good fish. And, uh... Yeah. And, and one of them was probably a fish that I've caught in that area before. Wow. But I, yeah. It, and there's, I, there's tagged fish. I caught a 35 incher on Saturday when I was out and had no tags. I've got a pit tag reader. This past Saturday? Yeah, when it was windy and nasty. I caught, That's when I caught that one on the fly I was telling you about. Oh, dude, that's freaking awesome. Okay, I didn't know that. And you have a reader. Is this something you have to get from like the state to, to have, or how does that work? You, you can hop on Amazon and get a pit tag reader. Hmm. So if it's a fish tracked by the state or if you want to see what the information is on an animal, you know, a dog or a cat, if they're chipped, you could flash them. I think it was like 25, 30 bucks, something like that. Hmm. Um, not terrible. It'll, it'll log X number of inputs or X number of scans if you find them. But um, the States put T tags in fish that they're tracking and you can send in for the reward. It's what the signage is about around the river. Um, and then the, the pit tags and it had neither of those. It was a super clean fish. Oh, wow. I don't know what that means. I'd like to think it means that there's a class of muskie in the, the Shenandoah that reproduce naturally. Uh, but I, I have no way to prove that. And I know that DWR is still trying to figure out, you know, what the, the spawn game is on the river. Is it working? Is it not? Obviously, it's a much different fishery than the James. So hopefully, big things come in here in the future, and and the fish are figuring out what they need to do. Or just like with the the bass spawns, you know, you got to have the right conditions, and they've got to hold for a certain amount of time so that stuff doesn't get washed down river, and you end up with a bad spawn year. That's the tale with all these rivers, isn't it? Like getting those good years. You can have one one high water event at an inopportune time and you get no fish that year. It and it's tough. We've had a few bad years on the Shenandoah. I I don't I mean it's a few bad years isn't gonna make or break the fishery, but if it's routine where we just keep getting slammed like mid April into mid May it's going to be tough and the the big fish are there but we need more big fish mm -hmm. to grow up because they don't live forever or god forbid somebody catches a seven plus pound smallmouth on the river and takes it home for dinner um and hopefully doesn't get sick What's the biggest smallmouth you've seen recently on the river? Recently, smallmouth, I've spooked four pound fish. That's not bad at all. Yeah, the and they're they kind of school up. So you you know plus or minus maybe a pound. You know water's going to add some distortion, but you see a big black bob blob on the bottom of the river that's not shaped like a catfish. And it's probably not a large mouth in most areas. Um, it's pretty good. The biggest fish I've seen come out was 22 plus inch that I caught a few years ago on a chatterbait. What I, I will never understand how a chatterbait works for smallmouth on the river. That blows my mind. So it, the smaller chatterbaits, like the little quarter ounce ones on a spinning rod, smash. I don't. It does. All I don't know why though. I, I, they're easy to throw. Yeah. So, you know, it's a, it's a confidence bait for a lot of people and I get it. Uh, I, I throw them because I, it, they weren't really a thing when I fished in this area in the mid to late two thousands. They're, you know, they're still growing. It was, it was still a booming 
following for a bladed jig. Uh, and then I, I moved back from Alaska and it's like, well, I guess I had to figure these things out. And I actually backlashed my bait caster and it, it just sunk to the bottom as a black and blue with a, uh, probably a silver blade on it. And I had like a, a speed shed, like, you know, paddle tail that I had chopped the end off of as a trailer. And it, probably got picked up as a, a crawdad on the bottom mm. but i i got my my backlash picked out i started picking up line and it was you know 20 feet up river from where i casted oh my gosh that's a good thing <laughs> so I, I that was the first time i thought i'd hooked up with a muskie on the river really yeah because i i had one scare me wet waiting there was a kind of an eddy in the area i was standing and I just thought it was a log kind of floating up and then it curled real hard on a, a ball of bait. And I just about jumped out of the water from being knee deep, just <laughs> I, out of my peripheral. I had no idea what was going on. Um, but yeah, there's, there's some really fishy areas of the river. Where do you think the, what, what part of the river do you think will, will bring out another monster smallmouth? Will it be one of the forks, the North or South? Or do you think it'll be in the main? You don't have to say which fork. You say forks or main. Man. Because to me, I think it's probably going to be the south fork. Unless you're talking the main fork, which is like Riverton and up. And we count that as the main. That could probably do it at Riverton or the dam. It, the, yeah, the water there is so deep on the main stem. That's not a point. Yeah. Uh, so, and there's more room, you know, bank to bank with the depth at 25 plus feet, depending on what the water's doing level wise. Um, man, that's, that's really tough because they were catching 22 plus inch smallmouth regularly on the North fork last year. I've caught them close to that size on the South fork and some of the stretches, uh, a couple guys that I've linked up with, they've caught some really nice ones on the South Fork. My big ones on the main. Um, it, I think all three have the potential for the next big fish. Yeah. Maybe, maybe not a state record breaker because the I think the James is probably getting close to to flirting with the new river as far as quality goes. Yeah. Uh, it, it's yeah. State record is. Yeah. And I wasn't even thinking state record. It's just the river is coming back clearly. And, and my PR is out of the main stem and everyone keeps hyping up the forks. And to me, it's the reason the forks are so good is because they're just so much smaller and it's easier to find that bigger one. They fish different for sure. Yeah. Um, now you definitely get your pocket water on the main. But in the middle of the summer, if you can find the deeper pools, you can usually find the fish. And if you fish the river regularly and you didn't appreciate me saying that, you can go on DWR's website. They literally tell you how to find musky. It, I, the, the information's out there. You just have to look for it. Um, bass, same way they're not going to want to hang out in, in hot bath water all day. They're going to find the cool spots. They're going to find access to fresh water with creeks coming in. They're going to find access to deep water so they can get out and relax. Or they're going to be hanging out in a pocket below a little rapid or a waterfall and get that high, higher oxygenated water as it's coming down river. Um, they, they all present different opportunities to do the same thing and i think that's what's really cool about this area and even just being in front royal like being located at the confluence you know i i don't fish the north fork a lot but if i had somebody that wanted to go fish the north fork and that's the area they wanted to fish yeah let's go figure it out it it's going to require some tweaking and obviously there may be some surprises drifting through a section of the river, but I'm, yeah, the fish are there. It, and 
having displaced ourselves so far from you know those gnarly fish kills uh as long as we can manage the the algae blooms moving forward with you know whatever balances in the river are causing those to happen and the fish can stay healthy you're you can't really make a bad choice in in an area to go fish or or even a guide anybody that spends time on the river and is offering their services they they probably know something you don't and it can it can make us a, a tough and successful day solo fishing a really nice day you know maybe not a hundred fish day because i i still think we're probably probably a decade out from from having that kind of experience on the shenandoah again regularly yeah we're we're we're, we're getting there's, we're going the right way we're going the right way yeah there's so many things that have to go right to get to that point um in the future but i mean having a five fish day is not a bad day you figured something out it probably wasn't five flukes you probably weren't fishing five different lures for the five different fish so you learned something there but you can take that five fish and you can turn it into 10 mm -hmm. or 20 or more if you're having a really fire day on the river Amen. um it it's just you take advantage do the and do the research dwr has got great material out there their website is awesome yeah, they really do, guys. And link in the episode description um, to, to their website as well. Brian, you know, I really can't thank you enough for coming on, telling your story um, as he gets going here with his guide service. Again, it, it's River Goat Outfitter. Ah, River Goat Outfitters. This is why we do pre recorded, guys. So that sounds good in the post. <laughs> River Goat Outfitters out of Front Royal, Virginia. Uh, Brian, anything else that you want to plug for me to put in the episode description? Uh, no, not really. Um, Books are open. Websites live. Rivergoatoutfitters dot com. Rivergoatoutfitters on on Instagram and Facebook. Um, yeah, I I'm happy to to talk to anybody. If you shoot us an email or you got questions, I'd love to take y'all out fishing, um, or or get you into a different spot of the river that maybe you don't go to regularly, uh, since access can be tough. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm here. Books are open. And if you're not coming out fishing with me, I'm probably fishing by myself. So it's always fun when you got a friend with you. Amen. That's absolutely true. Brian, I can't thank you enough. Guys, please, again, please like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps me out with the algorithm and it helps us to keep growing and expanding to find more and more people. We are the fastest growing outdoor fishing show in the DMV area. We'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.